A Farmer's Branch family. Time for Bible study from the big comfy chair. And I'm from my office chair again today, so it's big and comfy, not as big and comfy, comfy as the recliner, but uh, I've got more resources here at my fingertips. I've got uh, a couple of machines open, and so it'll be uh, a little more seamless, I hope, as we explore Zechariah's amazing prophecy. And with it, Daniel's amazing prophecy. And with it, how that interacts with the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew and the revelation given to John. Indeed. So let's get on into it. We are, we are in the 11th chapter of Zechariah. And we're going to make a little excursion back to the 4th chapter in a minute because last week you noticed that we had the 10th chapter and just a second I, this is the, something new has been added here um, it's given me the option to add other people to the live chat hmm anyway we'll, uh, this, this is a little bit different format uh, Facebook has changed a bit uh, how we get to this live stream. So it's going to be a little learning curve, I'm afraid. So remember, we paired the 10th chapter of um, Zechariah with the prophecy of Daniel and Revelation, the 13th chapter and 14th chapter and how they just have an amazing commonality and talk about the same events. Something very similar with the um, 12th chapter of Zechariah. Now, I will read it uh, from the Septuagint, uh, a tra English translation of the Septuagint. I, I don't do Greek nearly well enough to read it directly from the Septuagint. An issue of the Lord's word regarding Israel now, this is a separate prophecy. This prophecy is going to be separate from the last chapter. And they're not in chronological order in Zechariah. He talks about things not necessarily in the sequence that they are going to happen uh, in, in the fulfillment of these prophecies, but they're all given as separate visions and separate words of the Lord. An issue of the Lord's word regarding Israel. The Lord, as he stretches out heaven and founds the earth and forms the human spirit within, says, Behold, I set Jerusalem as a, as a shaking doorway for all the peoples round about. And this is idiomatic language. It means it, it's going to make them reel with drunkenness and, and make them dizzy. For all the peoples round about. And in Judea there will be a siege against Jerusalem. And it shall be on that day I will make Jerusalem a trampled stone for all the nations. Everyone who tramples it when mocking shall mock, and all the nations of the earth shall be gathered against it. On that day, says the Lord Almighty, I will strike every horse with alarm and its rider with derangement. But on the house of Judah I will open my eyes, and all the horses of the people will strike with blindness, and the officers of thousands in Judah shall say in their hearts, we shall find for ourselves the inhabitants of Jerusalem in the Lord Almighty, their God. And on that day, I will make the officers of thousands of Judah like a firebrand in wood and like a torch of fire in stubble. And they shall devour all the peoples round about to the right and to the left. And Jerusalem shall again dwell by itself. And the Lord will save the tents of Judah as from the beginning that the boast of the house of David and the elation of the inhabitants of Jerusalem might not be exalted over Judah. And it shall be on that day the Lord will be a shield for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the weak one among them in that day will be like David, and the house of David will be like a divine house, like an angel of the Lord before them. And it shall be on that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come out against Jerusalem. Now, what's this talking about? And how does it intermesh with the amazing prophecy of Daniel? Let's go to Daniel and see what this is talking about. 
It'll take me just a little bit to get there. And I would like to read that out of this translation of the Septuagint as well. Now here in Daniel 8 and on into the uh, 11th chapter as well, we see a story of a period of uh, Judah's history, Israel, the people of Israel in the form of Judah. We see this era, this place in their history where a, an evil king arises and uh, bad things happen. So what are, Zechari what are Zechariah and Daniel talking about? Let's read Daniel. It says, During the third year when Balthazar was king, there was a vision, which I, Daniel, saw after I saw the first one. And I saw in the vision of my dream when I was in Susa, the city, which is in the region of LMA, while I was still by the gate of Olam, when I looked up, I saw one large ram standing in front of the gate, and it had stately horns. And the one was more stately, and the, steady, and the stately one came up. But after this, I saw a ram charging to the north and to the west and to the south, and no beast stood after it. And no one could rescue, rescue from its hands, and it was doing as it wanted, and it became exalted. And I was pondering, and lo, a male goat of goats was coming from the west over the face of the earth, and it did not touch the ground and one horn of the male goat was between its eyes. And it came at the ram which had the horns, which I'd seen standing by the gate, and it ran against it in a furious rage. And I saw it approaching toward the ram, and it was inflamed against it, and it struck and crushed its two horns, and there was no longer power in the ram to stand against the male goat. And it rent it asunder on the ground and crushed it, and there was no one who could rescue the ram from the male goat. And the male goat of goats prevailed exceedingly, and when it prevailed, its great horn was crushed. And another four horns came up behind it toward the four winds of heaven. And one out of them sprang one strong horn, and out of one of them sprang one strong horn, and it prevailed, and it struck against the south, against the east, and against the north. And it was raised into the stars of the sky, and it was thrown down upon the earth from the stars and was trodden upon by them until the commander-in-chief delivered the captives. And the mountains which were from eternity were overthrown on account of it, and their place and sacrifice were taken away. And he put it to the ground, and it prospered, and it emerged, and the sanctuary will be desolated and the sins were on the offering, and justice was thrown to the ground, and it acted and it prospered. And I kept hearing another holy one speaking, and the other one said to the Felmuni who was speaking, How long will this vision continue? Even the sacrifice which has been taken away, and the sin or the abomination of desolation that has been given, and the sanctuaries will be desolated unto trampling. And he said to him, 2,300 days, evenings, and mornings, and the sanctuary will be purified. Now, we, he goes on to tell us that the, he's, what he's talking about is the kingdom of Mede, the Medes and Persians, who are the two horns of the ram. And then the goat is, or the Greeks, uh, with their king Alexander uh, that would come. It doesn't mention Alexander by name, but that's what it's referring to. And then re upon his the death of that one mighty horn, four arise in it pl its place, one of which becomes more prominent than the others. And this would be the Seleucid Empire that replaced the Greek Empire uh, as, the, uh, as the ones that would dominate uh, Judea. And so out of this, we then see the events of the 11th chapter. Now let's go ahead and, 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 and read the rest of the 8th. It says, And it happened that when I, Daniel, was seeing, I was seeking to comprehend the vision. 
and lo, one having the appearance of a human stood in front of me, and I heard a human voice in the midst of the alam. And after the human cried out, he said, The vision is for this ordinance. And he came and stood near where I stood, and he, when he came, I was be, became bewildered and fell on my face. And he said to me, Consider, O son of man, for this vision is yet for an appropriate time. And while he spoke with me, I slept face down on the ground, and as he touched me, he roused me on the spot, and he said to me, Lo, I am telling you what will take place at the end of the wrath against the sons of the people, for yet will remain the appropriate time of consummation. The ram that you saw, which had the horns, is the king of the Medes and Persians, and the male goat of goats is the king of the Greeks. And the great horn that is between its eyes is one is the first king. And for, as for the four horns that were crushed and came up after it, four kings will arise from this, his nation, not in accordance with their power. And at the last of their reign, when their sins are full, a king shameless of countenance will arise, who understands obscure sayings, and his power will be established, and he will destroy terribly, and he will prosper and will accomplish, and he will destroy the powerful and the common people of the holy ones. And his thought will be against the holy ones, and they, the lie will prosper by his hands, and his heart will be exalted. And by deceit he will annihilate many, and he will rise by the destruction of men, and he will make a gathering by hand and will repay. The evening and morning vision I was told truthfully, and now the vision is closed, for it is yet many days. I, Daniel, having been weak, many days and having risen again was con conducting the royal affairs and I was continually upset by the vision and there was no one who comprehended it. So here we have uh, events that I think are uh, both described by Zechariah and Daniel which as we will see are also described in the 11th chapter of the Revelation. In apocalyptic terms. Now you really will not understand the setting of these two prophecies and uh, the description in apocalyptic terms by John in Revelation if you do not know the history of this period of time. This story is told, and I'm going to straighten the camera here for just a second, I just noticed it's a little bit tilted, and that didn't help a bit. Sorry. So, uh, if you don't know the history that this is describing, the history that this is describing is that of the Maccabean Revolt, or the Maccabean Civil War in Judah, uh, more accurately. Uh, we're going to read a bit in uh, the Maccabees, but you really, really should read First and Second Maccabees for yourself. I don't think Third and Fourth books of Maccabees uh, add greatly to the history of this, but this is an amazing Old Testament work of history. And it's a, it's a pivotal time in the history of uh, Judah. It's a time when the priesthood and the leadership became corrupted and they became enamored of all things Greek, culture, religion, and the sacrifice in the temple was neglected and finally replaced with pagan worship. And the Greek pantheon was installed in the temple of God in Jerusalem. And sacrifices were made on the altar of God, which had been overlaid with an altar to Zeus Olympus, a god of fortresses whose adherents, uh, fathers, never worshipped. And there was a king that came up among them named Antiochus, and he called himself Antiochus Epiphanes. And even though he did rule as a tyrant and he did trample the temple, he placed an altar to Zeus Olympus on the, overlaid it over the altar of God at the temple in Jerusalem. He installed the entirety of the Greek pantheon there to be worshiped. He also instituted temple prostitution uh, in the worship of these pagan gods. And it was a very dark time 
in the history of Judah. Preceding this, however, the uh, daily sacrifice had been neglected. The priests, it seemed, uh, preferred to go to the new Greek gymnasium, which was built adjacent to the temple, and, uh, and watch wrestling matches and other forms of Greek entertainment. In fact, it became popular, the gymnasium, which is really Greek for the place of nakedness because the Greeks uh, enjoyed their physical exercise while without clothing. So the gymnasium, the place of nakedness, uh, was one that uh, the Jews became very uh, taken with. And they would go for the gymnasium exercise. In the books of Maccabees, it says that they even started to wear the chapeau, the, the Greek cap, uh, in preference for more uh, Jewish attire. Uh, and that because their mark of their Judaism, their circumcision was so apparent at the gymnasium being a place of nakedness, that many actually underwent crude, uh, very painful surgical procedures to try to reverse the cosmetic effects of their circumcision. Uh, this was mainly uh, an affectation of the urban elite around Jerusalem, while the common people in the countryside still largely uh, clung to their uh, Jewish heritage. Now, when Antiochus comes and runs roughshod and loots the temple and places, uh, installs the Greek pantheon into the temple in Jerusalem. He outlaws all things Jewish. He outlaws circumcision and the people that were faithful to the law of God suffered greatly at his hands. The, uh, when this began to spill over into the countryside, Mattathias a priest from a priestly family was present when they tried to institute the, set, the offering of a, sacri a sacrificial pig on an altar in the town where he lived. Because he was a, a priestly family and was a senior member of the community, they insisted that he offer the pig as a sacrifice to God, and he refused. And when one stepped forward to, to do it on his behalf because he was threatened with death by the official there locally, uh, Mattathias slew the man on the spot and a revolt began. And Mattathias died shortly after that, but his sons carried on this revolt against the leadership in Jerusalem. And so we, we, we see here that the prophecy speaks of, in Judah, uh, captains of a thousands, and that's not many. What the point here is that only a few thousand would end up routing armies of the nations around them, especially the Syrian armies. You know, if you read First and Second Maccabees, you'll see occasion, one occasion at least, where an army of no more than six thousand under the command of Judas Maccabeus, Maccabeus being uh, a, der a derivative of the, he of the Hebrew word for hammer, who was the initial leader among the four brothers of the sons of Mattathias, that these 6,000 were up against uh, a Syrian army of 110,000 infantry, um, cavalry, uh, chariots outfitted with sids. These were bl these these rotating blades on the wheels that would cut a wide swath through an infantry, as well as armored elephants, were all part of this army of of what amounted to around one hundred and forty thousand heavily armed troops, and the six thousand no more than six thousand of Judas Maccabeus' troops would uh, prevail and would win a, 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 a victory. Now, last week we studied Bar Kokhba, 
who was the worthless shepherd spoken of by Zechariah. And we read about the, his role in Daniel in the seventh chapter. This is very much a different story. In this story, which precedes the, those events in the first and second century AD, uh, they implored God's help. They appealed to God and they prayed fervently before every battle and, and, and gave him the glory and the honor for the victories that they won. And history, historians have always been puzzled at the military success that uh, Judas Maccabeus had uh, and his forces. And it's a wonderful story of the provision of God. And we see it in, uh, enshrined in apocalyptic language in the Revelation. And let's go there and read that. We go to Revelation. The 11th chapter. Now really, the, the, the story leading up to this, all of this, this is just part of the story of the second woe. You remember the, 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 the second woe begins back here in the ninth chapter of Revelation. Second woe begins around uh, the twelfth verse. Well, we've talked. He's just had the apocalyptic vision of the Assyrian and Babylonian captivities, and the persons of the armies of uh, Abaddon or Apollyon. And in the twelfth verse, it says, "The first woe is past; two other woes are yet to come." And the sixth angel sounded his trumpet, and I heard a voice coming from the four horns of the golden altar that's before God. And it said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who were bound at the great river Euphrates, and the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. And he, said, he goes on with his vision here, and I, I believe that this is the, the, the Greek army that uh, conquers the known world. And, and it says that the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see, hear, or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. And then when we go to the 10th, Verse, we have the story of the little scroll, which is a parallel story to the little scroll of Ezekiel. You remember Ezekiel is given a little scroll by the angel and he's told to eat it. And he does, and it tastes like honey in his mouth. And he says, I'm not, and the angel says, I'm not sending you to a people, or God says to him, I'm not sending you to a people whose language you don't understand. I'm sending you to Judah. He said, and whether they hear you or not, this is what you're to say. And it was sweet in his mouth because he would be speaking to his own people. Now here we have the similar story um, with John. And it says, so I went to the angel and I asked him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be sweet like honey. Lord, it will be like honey in your mouth. It's the words of God, but it's going to make you sick to your stomach. Well, why? Because unlike the scroll that was given to the prophet Ezekiel, he takes the little scroll and he says, I took the little scroll and it tasted sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I'd eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. In other words, this is not, this word is not to a people of a unified language. This is uh, a people who is far more diverse. And so here in the, what follows is the story of the two witnesses. Now, uh, there's all sorts of nonsense 
running about about these two witnesses. There's a new movie out that's got fire, literal fire coming out of their mouths, and it's two human beings that are the witnesses. That's not what this apocalyptic language is talking about, not in the least. It says, I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and I was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers. Now, when you see a measuring rod in the hand of the prophet, uh, you understand that it is being measured out for judgment, usually for destruction. And so here it says, measure the temple of God and the altar and its worshipers. Well, that's terrible. That's terribly, terrible, fearful uh, language. Something bad is about to happen to the temple, its altar, and its worshipers. I think maybe like having the sacrifice abandoned and pagan gods installed and to the worship in the temple and sacrifice to God taken away. It'd be awfully bad. He says, but exclude the outer court. Don't measure it. What's the outer court? It's the court of the Gentiles. Don't measure and judge the court of the Gentiles because it's been given to the Gentiles and they will trample on the holy city for 42 months. That's the length of time in the history of the Maccabean Civil War that Antiochus trampled on the city. And I will appoint my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. The time that temple was still under the control of the Jewish priesthood but the sacrifices were neglected and I will appoint my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,260 days closed in sackcloth so who are the two witnesses they are the two olive trees and the two lampstands and they stand before the Lord of the earth Zechariah talked about two olive trees. Remember when we covered that? And that was the word to Zerubbabel, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. Because in fact, he said, Zerubbabel will complete my temple. Now that's the story of two different Zerubbabel's sons of Shealtiel. Now I'm not sure I got into that adequately when we went through there. It's a, it's an, uh, it's a fascinating story because you see a... Uh, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, in both Matthew's and Luke's genealogy of Christ. Matthew's genealogy, of course, is that of Joseph. Um, Luke's genealogy is that of Mary. But there is a, Sheel, a Shealtiel with a son named Zerubbabel in both of them, but different fathers for Shealtiel. One of the line of Solomon and Jeconiah, who God said, you are one as one that childless to me. It, the line of Solomon ends here as far as the king and the messianic promise. And we know that Nathan um, was the real progenitor of Christ. And so, interestingly enough, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. Well, the two olive trees of Zechariah, the two olive trees here. What describes them? In, in, in Zechariah, they are the witnesses that pour oil into the messianic light that would be the Messiah, that would bring the Messiah, the law and the prophets. Well, are the law and the prophets described here in Revelation? Let's see. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. Now, where do we see fire coming from the mouth and devouring their enemies. We actually see that in the 13th chapter of the apocryphal book, 2nd Esdras. 2nd Esdras is referred, is, uh, there are allusions to that all through the New Testament. And I think that you need to read the words of that prophecy too. But in talking about the Son of Man, the Son of God, in the prophecy of 2nd Esdras, it describes fire coming from his mouth to devour his enemies. And that, that's not a literal fire. It is, in fact, the word of the law of God. And that's what's being spoken of here, is 
figurative fire in this apocalyptic language, not literal fire coming out of a man's mouth. It says, if anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies, in keeping with Second Ezra's, being the law of God. And this is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they're prophesying. This is what Elijah did as a, as a, a type of the prophets and have the power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want, which was, of course, the actions of Moses, the one who brought the law from Sinai. It says, now when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Now, it can't be anywhere but Jerusalem. And so here, this story of the Maccabean revolt, where the law and the prophets, the two witnesses to the messianic light of Christ, would lie figuratively dead in the streets for a period of time. Three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth or the land here is the Greek geos, it's more appropriately in this context translated land. The inhabitants of the land, as in the land of Judah, will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other's gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. There was gift giving in the story of the Maccabean revolt. They literally gave gifts to each other. Uh, many of those gifts were in the form in, uh, in, in the form of bribes back and forth. Uh, when you read the account, you'll see that, and it's interesting that the Jewish festival that celebrates the events of the Maccabean revolt is called Hanukkah or the Feast of Dedication. And they still give gifts to each other. I've asked some Jewish friends, you know, why do you give gifts on Hanukkah? And they said, we don't know. But the inhabitants of the land will gloat over them and celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on them. So when Judas Maccabeus and his brothers took up arms, it was a whole different day. Now these events, like I say, let's just go to Maccabees. I've got a common English Bible translation here that uh, will be helpful. If we go to 2 Maccabees, let's say the 13th chapter. And I would, I'll just read you um, the nature in, in contrast to Bar Kokhba, whose prayer before battle was, God, we don't need your help. Just don't embarrass us in front of our enemies. Just don't help our enemies. Replacing the efforts of man for the provision of God. Here's a, here's a typical encounter. Um, it says, with, with the, in the Maccabean Revolt, said, the king became barbaric in his thoughts and intended to show the Jews far worse things than his father did. When Judas learned of these things, he commanded the community to call on the Lord day and night, now if ever, to help those soon to be deprived of the law, the homeland, and the holy temple. They were to pray that the people who had recently enjoyed temporary relief not be permitted again to come under the control of slanderous nations. After everyone had prayed in the same manner together, pleading with the merciful Lord with weeping and fasting and lying face down for three days, 
Judas called them together and commanded them to report for duty. In consultation with the elders, Judas decided to march out to determine the matter by God's help before the enemy of the king could enter Judah and take control of the city. He left the decision to the creator of the universe and called on his men to fight to the death for the law of God. He made the region of Modain his headquarters and gave his men the watchword, God's victory. Not our victory, but God's victory. He chose the best of the young men and attacked the king's quarters in the enemy camp at night. They killed nearly 2,000 men as well as the lead elephant, stabbing its rider. And after they filled the camp with fear and panic, they departed in good spirits. This had happened just as the day was dawning before the Lord's protection had come to Judah's aid. Because the Lord's protection had come to Judas' aid. Judas Maccabeus. Now, it's a much different story. It is the story that, about when the messianic light of the law and the prophets was nearly extinguished from Jerusalem. And we read in the prophecies of Daniel and Zechariah, the purpose for this was to restore the messianic hope and the light that would result in the coming of Christ. Now, we've, we're already about 40 minutes into this lesson. And, and, and to get back into how this transitions into the coming of Christ in the prophecies of Zechariah and Daniel. We'll have to wait till next week. Take care, Farmer's Branch.